Today we are going through the first part of a several part video series showing you guys how exactly to go about LS swapping a vehicle. The vehicle in question for this video series is a 1968 Chevrolet Malibu Chevelle, also known as a Chevelle Malibu. But for all intents and purposes, we're just going to be calling this car the 68 Chevelle. Unlike the other projects on this channel, this car is not actually owned by me. This Chevelle is actually owned by Anthony, which also happens to own California Auto Works, where I get all my dyno testing done. We're working together on this build so we can help people decide what they need and don't need when it comes to LS swapping a vehicle. Later on, we're going to be turning this car into an actual street machine, but that is still a ways away, so let's focus on the task at hand for now. This car originally came equipped with a 305 cubic inch small block Chevy paired up with the Powerglide automatic transmission. Since we're going to be swapping out the engine, we might as well swap out the transmission for something a little bit more modern. Since I only deal with the most pristine engines, I decided to go down to my local iPull U-Pull and went and picked myself a nice fresh 5.3 liter LS that ended up being paired with a 4L60E 4-speed automatic transmission. Once I got back, it was time to unload the engine and transmission and begin cleanup. Anthony decided to give the 4L60E a once over on the transmission while I went ahead and cleaned up the block. Now that I finally have you guys up to speed, it's time to begin the real LS swap. So we just pushed in the Chevelle into one of the stalls right here at the shop. The engine that we're going to be dropping in is this one that we have right here. This is a Gen 3 5.3 liter. We picked this up at the junkyard. It was completely trashed, full of gunk. We weren't actually sure if the motor was going to be any good or not, but we went ahead and we pulled off the pan just to look inside. And as you guys can see, you can easily tell that these are Gen 3 rods. The motor does spin freely, so if you guys know if it spins, it does win. The rods are all the same color. The only thing you want to look for is for any kind of discoloration. So they're all goldish, dirty, but there's no blue, there's no purples, there's no black, so everything is good to go. We're not gonna even bother to pull the caps off. We're not gonna pull any pistons out. In fact, the heads are still on the motor, so we're not gonna be worrying about that either. In order to have access to the rods, you have to remove the oil pan, the windage tray, and the pickup, but we're not actually gonna install those components back on. Instead, we're going to be jumping over to a component from the guys at Jags. This is an F-body oil pan, since we're gonna be installing this onto the Chevelle. Uh, we're gonna need a, an appropriate oil pan to go along with it, so this is a really nice unit. It's cast aluminum, just like the OEM one with a couple of features here on top. But before we can install that, we're gonna have to go through a couple of things uh, right here on the motor. So the pickup for this is actually this one that's over here. And I'm actually joined here with Anthony from California Auto Works. Anthony, uh, why do we actually have to change the pickup if we're just changing the oil pan? We have to change the pickup to line up with the depth of the oil pan. Also, we cannot use a truck pan on a Chevelle because it'll hang below the subframe and turn into a speed bump for speed bumps and brake. Also, we had to change the fitting on the F-body pan because we didn't get a truck adapter, so we took the one off of the truck pan and put it on here so we can use a taller truck filter. I'm looking at the pickup right now and I'm noticing that this pickup has a spot for two bolts, whereas the OEM one only has a spot for one and this one's welded up. Is there any particular reason for that or is that just a cosmetic thing or what's up? I don't know why they put two bolt holes and didn't use them both. Because they seem to have a problem when the gasket flattens out. But I am not an engineer, so. Yeah, so we should have a more positive seal with two bolt holes, I'm assuming, instead of it lining up crooked. Because on the factory one, it's not welded on, and on this aftermarket one, it is. So I'm assuming that as you tighten the bolts down, everything should come in a little bit tighter. Also, we cannot use a truck windage tray because it does interfere with our pickup tube. We could buy a F-body one, but this is gonna be a dyno queen, so I'm not gonna take it to the track or do road racing with it. We're just gonna blow it up. So, we're just gonna run it with the one we got from Jig. And also, we're not taking it apart, because if we take it apart, we're gonna let the magic out. And if the magic comes out of it, it will blow up. All right, so I have the bottom of the block all dressed up. The oil pan kit actually came with brand new bolts, so I didn't have to reuse the stock ones, which is nice. I actually ended up cleaning them up, but I'm not gonna have to use them after all. Plus these have a wider flange head, which is always nice. 
I went ahead and I torqued all of these bolts down because apparently there's an issue that when you over torque these gaskets, you tweak them and they end up leaking. You end up tightening them more and then it actually seals up for a bit, but then it starts leaking again. So, so the torque spec for all the shorter bolts were 18 foot pounds and the torque spec for the ones in the back were I believe 102 inch pounds which is only like 10 foot pounds or something. So I don't actually normally torque any of this down. This is actually a suggestion to me by Anthony. I've never personally had a problem with these pans leaking, but I also don't super over torque them. So that might also be part of it. One thing that did come up though, is that there is an extra bolt hole, and I use the word extra lightly because apparently on the Gen 3, they don't actually have that bolt hole. Actually it's blank right there. And apparently on the Gen 4 motors, there is a bolt hole, which is actually this pan over here is a Gen 4. And you can see that the bolt hole is right there. So if you don't have a hole here, I wouldn't worry about it too much. The kit did come with the appropriate bolt in case you wanted to run this bolt, but you would have to go ahead and drill and tap it and do all that stuff. So probably not something you'd want to do, but nice that the pan gives you the option to do so. Like we mentioned earlier, we went ahead and we switched out the oil fitting adapter so we can use the standard truck oil filters. But the oil pan kit actually did come with the proper car oil filter adapter. But since we have a bunch of the truck filters, we went ahead and switched that over to the truck filter as well. Aside from that, we still have to install the oil drain plug. And then we've got two fittings up here in the front. And these are actually for turbo drains. Now, the Jags oil pan actually comes with the appropriate plugs. I believe they're 3 8 MPT fittings. I got to go ahead and double check. Actually, I'll go ahead and leave a link to that in the description down below. But the pan does come with the appropriate fittings for you to block these off. But because we're going to have eventual turbos on this, we're gonna go ahead and install the proper AN lines and then we're just gonna cap them off and uncap them when it's time to actually hook these up. So for the time being, we're gonna go ahead and install some thread sealing on this. And then we're going to go ahead and install these on the side of the pan. Now that I've got the entire pan all assembled minus the oil filter, Let's go ahead and move on to the last thing before we can flip this engine over and that's going to be the engine mounts themselves. But it's actually a combination between the engine mounts and the mount adapters. Let me show you what I mean. On the other side I've already installed one and I only have one left now. So I have this adapter. We are using the GM LS engine to small block Chevy adapters. And this kit comes with this plate that we have right here. It also comes with the appropriate hardware. It also comes with the rubber mount and everything to bolt it on together. The only thing it does not come with is instructions. And so I actually have to figure this out before I turn the camera on. But overall, it's actually not that difficult. Let me go ahead and show you how you take care of this. The first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is you're going to wanna to take some of these countersunk bolts and you're gonna run them through these holes right here out the back. And the reason for that is that if you try to install this plate after it's installed inside the block, you won't have enough room to run these bolts in. These plates actually have like two, three threads on the back side, so you should be able to run these in just enough to get everything torqued down. So let me go ahead and do that and I'll show you the orientation of this on the motor. Like I mentioned before, there are no real instructions inside the box, but you can kind of figure out what you're supposed to do. So they gave us this anti-seize, and the anti-seize is actually for the bolts that are going into the block. I personally like to use thread locker because I don't want them vibrating out, but anti-seize works just as good. They do the opposite thing, obviously. Anti-seize so bolts don't get stuck, and the thread locker is so that bolts don't come back out. The purpose for each item is almost exactly the same. The point is that you want to fill in all the gaps in the thread so that way later on the bolts are not difficult to remove. That being said, on these countersunk bolts specifically, you really want to use anti-seize and not thread locker. And the reason for that is that these are driven in with a hex head. If later on down the road you want to remove this from the block, the hex could be worn out, it could be eaten up by corrosion, it could be damaged. And so you want to have the least amount of resistance when pulling this back out of the block so you don't have to bust out the grinder or the welder. So in that particular situation, I would definitely go with the anti-seize and not the thread locker. So like mentioned before, the engine is actually upside down, so keep that in mind when looking at these adapters. So the proper orientation for these adapters is going to be like this with the two studs that we just put in. Those are going to be on the bottom, or in reality, they're the top. The deciding factor on that is the motor mount or engine mount themselves. You can see it is in a T-shape and it only goes on one way. The two studs actually slip into here and then you just add the final bolt. The final bolt's going to line up right here. And the reason you know it's set up like this and not the other way around is that 
the engine mount has a little ledge right here it's a little piece of steel kind of like a guide to tell you that when you go to drop the engine down that's where the engine's going to stop if the mount was upside down then you could see that there would be a problem with trying to drop the engine onto the mounts so going by the assumption that it's supposed to be like this you can now understand that if the engine's upside down then it has to be like this once you have the orientation down you have to figure out whether this goes on the left or the right side so the rule of thumb for that is that the small block chevys actually mount towards the front of the engine whereas the ls's tend to mount in the middle of the engine so keeping those two things in mind let's go ahead and set the orientation of this mount which is going to be like this which is going to end up like this keeping that in mind we're going to go ahead and present this to the engine and you can see that this is the way that it's supposed to go the other side is the exact same way. If we go over to the other side, I'll show you exactly what I mean. So going by the same logic, this engine is going to drop onto the cradle. So we're gonna want this on the top, AKA the bottom side. So when it's all mounted onto this bracket, it's gotta sit upside down. And because we've gotta make sure that this mount sits forward of the engine, this is the exact position where it needs to be. Now I'm gonna go ahead and install the other side and then we're going to flip the engine over and get the other stuff sorted out. Right before I flipped the engine over, I actually realized a mistake. And that was with this guy right here. I double checked the package for one of these inside the box and I didn't see one. And I assumed that this pan didn't come with one. Well, as I was installing these motor mounts and I moved some boxes out of the way, I found the actual bypass block off. So we can actually go ahead and take the stock one that I cleaned off and installed. We can take that one off and install this one. That would be the solid plan for the average person. But what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to keep the stock one on or at least keep the stock one on hand. And the reason for that is because there is a hole that is not tapped inside of this bypass. So you can actually use this fitting to feed a turbo, an oil pressure gauge or whatever. So what I'm thinking is that I'm actually just going to leave it here and not install the one that came with the pan. But in any other situation, I would definitely install this one over the stock one. So now that we've got all that out of the way, let's go ahead and flip the engine over. Anthony is actually over on the bench finishing up the transmission as we speak. So this is a 4L60. I'm going to let Anthony finish it up. Just a basic 4L60. has a SunX uh, sun shell in it. It's got my own 3-4 clutch stack. It's got a Transgo Pro uh, shift kit and everything in it. And other than that, it's stock input output. It's got a 500 boost valve from Transgo. <clears throat> Hopefully we can get it to hold some power. If not, I'll take it apart and fix it. Any particular reason we're gonna go with the 4L60 instead of the 4L80? Uh, right now, this is pretty cheap to do. A 4L80 requires me to change the drive shaft and a bigger shaft and depending on your setup, it could make you have to hammer the trans tunnel but as far as like getting it to mate together and i already have a 3200 stall converter for a 4l60 so this is what we're going to do so basically this is the cheapest most effective way to get this thing finished yes there it is all right well i'll let you get on that in the meantime i'm going to prep this engine to go get it ready to get dropped in all right, so this is as clean as this engine is going to get. We went ahead and we installed the electric water pump that we're gonna be using. This is actually a big block Chevy water pump with a set of Proform adapters for it to fit the LS. This is just the easiest way to get an electric water pump onto an LS. Now, if you were gonna be using this for a daily driver, I probably wouldn't recommend switching over to an electric water pump, but we're gonna be doing a lot of dyno stuff and it's a lot easier to remove an electric water pump than it is to remove a standard water pump. We're keeping the factory dampener and the only thing we got to figure out now is how we're going to install an alternator but i think we're just going to go ahead and mount the transmission onto this engine and then go ahead and drop it into the 68 chevelle mission accomplished we got the front end completely unbolted off of the car we went ahead and raised the car up and now we are trying to bolt the transmission and engine together before we actually drop it in inside of the car it's a lot easier to do it all as one unit than it is to drop the engine in and then try to put the transmission in from the bottom. We can obviously do that because we have a lift, but if you're just doing this on the floor, it's much easier just to do this as a unit and having an extra set of hands doesn't hurt either. It looks like we've ran into a snag here. We've got the engine pretty close. It looks like the motor mounts are going to line up. It's pretty close to the mounting point on the car. We've got the tail shaft on top of the cross member up back towards the middle of the car. The issue we have now is earlier in the video, we showed you guys that we installed these turbo drains 
but they might not actually clear in this application so instead of trying to find out a little bit later and potentially damaging these actual fittings we're going to go ahead and remove them we've got one on each side we're going to pull them out we're going to plug them and then we're going to drop the motor in if we actually have room to pull them back out and install the drains back in then we will do so but if not then we're just going to have to live without them and do something else for a turbo drain later on but so far so good everything looks like it's lining up we got the engine to drop in like we wanted it to but now we're having another issue out here in the back we had to unbolt the cross member for the transmission and lucky on these cars it's got a bunch of different little mounting holes that we can pick so through that we're going to choose one that gets us close the holes for the tranny mount are actually elongated so we can be about a half inch off either way so as soon as we can find the right combination of bolts and hardware, we should be able to get this bolted on without any more modifications. We've somewhat secured the drive shaft in place and it looks like it's in a precarious position right here in the back of the transmission, but we've already done the math and we've already cycled the suspension. And as the tires climb up, the drive shaft actually pulls out a little bit. So for the time being, it looks like everything looks okay. As we continue on with this video series, I'll keep you updated on whether or not this drive shaft worked. But as for right now, all signs point to yes. The transmission cross member, we ended up moving it a couple holes down this way, actually just one bolt hole down this way, and then just a couple bolt holes down this way, backward. And we were able to reuse the 700R4 transmission mount, and we were able to reuse all the factory hardware that was on this transmission prior. The only thing we had to do was install shorter bolts inside of the tail housing, only because the original bolts were too long and they were going to uh, dig into the case. As for the engine mounting position itself, if you guys can tell that we are in a really good spot. We could go forward if we wanted to. If we wanted to move everything forward, we could, but right where those motor mounts put us we are in a really really good spot our decision to move on to the f-body oil pan was a really smart move if we would have ran the truck pan it would have still been a decent option we still would have been able to install it but it would hang a couple inches lower than the front cross member which is not a problem if you're not planning to drive it out on the street but as soon as you hit a pothole or something you're going to lose all oil pressure and it's not going to be a fun day for you let's go ahead and take a look at this motor when it's up on top so between the firewall and the engine, we actually have a ton of clearance. If we wanted to move the engine further back, we actually could. We have another, I'd say, inch and a half or two inches before we run into an issue. But as I mentioned earlier, we are running a 4L60. If we were trying to shoehorn a 4L80 in here, we would definitely have a ton of problems and some cutting and some grinding would have to be done to the interior of the car. But if you're running a 700R4, you'll probably not run into any of those issues and only if you're running a 4L60 are you going to have very minute issues or depending on the body it might not be any issues at all. Cost wise to swap in your motor currently we have the engine and transmission from the junkyard, we have the conversion motor mounts, we also have the F-body oil pan. For the grand total of the swap this is what we're looking at so far. If you're running this into a car with a little bit more ground clearance like a Silverado or an S10 you would not have to change out the oil pan. But if you're swapping this into anything that has a small block or a big block from the factory, the conversion motor mounts are a must. In the next episode, we're gonna be covering all of the fuel system that's gonna be needed for this. And we're gonna be showing you guys how to take care of that yourself. So I will see you guys all in the next one. Night Wrencher, signing out.